This is a reading of Code Talker, chapter 21, Guam, and this is gonna be part one. While the Marines of the second and fourth division were taking Saipan, our third Marine division boarded our own ships and set sail, ready to hit the beaches. The landing on Guam was set for June 18th. But it didn't happen. At the last minute, Admiral Spruance decided to send the 27th Army Division, the soldiers who were supposed to be our backup, to help take Saipan. The 3rd Division was ordered to hold their position. The unit I was in was sent back to the little island of Kuwa Jalin and E, I'm sorry, N I We Tuck to the east of Guam. It was hard being told just to wait on those little islands without knowing what was going to happen or when. There ain't nothing here to do but count legs, Georgia Boy said as we sat in our barracks watching the land crabs cuddling up and down the coconut trees. Those big crabs made me nervous about going out at night. They looked like gigantic spiders and were common on N E we took as ground squirrels are back home. If I ever stepped on one in my bare feet, I was sure it would chop my toes off with those big pincers. I was teased about being more scared of crabs than enemy soldiers, but no amount of teasing could get me to set foot out of the barracks after dark. When every place outside was crawling with crabs and you can hear them rustling and clicking through the palm leaves, all there was to do on those islands was drill and swim, play cards and eat fish, complain and sleep. but we were better off board on shore than stuck on board like the other Marine units. They were kept coop up, cooped up on the hot crowded transport ships out at sea, stuck there for almost two months, just waiting. Another strange thing about war, grandchildren, is that when things do not go as planned, they might turn out better. So it was in our invasion of Guam, our landing was delayed but not the Navy bombardment. Instead of only one day, they now had almost two weeks to work over the coast of Guam. They were ed led by Admiral Connolly. Everyone knew him as Close Up Connolly, and he really lived to that nickname. Admiral Connolly had learned from the mistakes at Bougainville and Tar Tarawa, where the naval shelling had been too brief or too inaccurate to break down Japanese defenses. Close up Connolly brought his three cruiser divisions and six battleships in right next to the shore to pound the coastal defenses. For 13 days, the battleships boomed and heavy shells rained down on targets. By the time Admiral Connolly was done, the Japanese beach defenses were pulverized. Airstrikes had also wiped out all of the Japanese planes on Guam that might have attacked our invading forces. Finally, we were loaded back on ships and off the shores of Guam. It meant a lot for us to take Guam. Guam was a US territory. Before the Japanese attack, it had been an American island. I'd read some about it in my geography book in Navajo High School, and I was reading more about it now. That was one thing that I did before every invasion. I scraped up whatever reading matter there was on board ship about the place we were going. Begay here is our travel agent, our Lieutenant Wisecracked. He's always checking out all the best hotels for us to stay in. Even though they kidded me, the other guys asked me what I had learned about Guam and I told them. Its people had been American citizens since the Spanish-American War. They were called Chamorros, a U.S. naval base, a deep water harbor, and a marine airfield. All had been taken over by the Japanese when they invaded Guam on December 8, 1941, 
the day after the attack of Pearl Harbor. The Shamoros had stayed loyal to us after the Japanese came and they tried to resist. As a result, the Japanese have been very cruel to them. If Chamaras refused to work for the Japanese, they were shot or put into concentration camps on the island. You know, grandchildren, for a long time, even after the war, it was hard for me to have any good thoughts about the Japanese. What troubled me the most was the way they treated the native people of the islands they conquered. They believed only Japanese were real humans. Anyone else could be treated like a dog. Never forget, grandchildren, that we must always see all other people as human beings worthy of respect. We must never forget, as the Japanese forgot, that all life is holy. To Munbei, Major General Turnage said to his officers as he stood on the bridge. With a wave of his hand, he indicated the wide two and a half mile sweep of beach was now in view. Although I was assigned to a landing party, I was up there on the bridge checking signals with the other members of our code team who would be staying on board to send and receive messages. Because of our special role, we code talkers were often able to go places where ordinary Marines hardly ever set foot. Best landing place on the island, Major General Turnage said, nodding his head. No reef to cross, nice level sand, darn fine landing place, just where the enemy expects us. Then he said, sorry to disappoint them. Instead of Tumon Bay, we went further south. There we would have to cross the reef to land on two Western beaches that lay below the sheer bluffs. July 21st was set for the invasion. W Day, as our leaders named it. As the first light outlined the island, I stood by the rail watching. I managed to find a wooden box to stand on, so I wasn't just looking at the backs of other Marines as sometimes happened. Hey, little fella, want me to boost you up on my shoulders? A familiar voice said from behind me. It was Smitty, of course. He sometimes kidded me about being so short, but I always had an easy answer. Bigger guys make bigger targets. The next thing I knew, I was on an alligator rumbling over the reef. I could hear the roar of the LVT's engines, the whap, whap, whap of the small waves hitting the metal side of the boat and the coral being crushed by the threads, sort of like the sound sugar cubes makes when they are crushed between teeth but I don't even remember hearing the whistle and the order to land the landing party. Once again, I had the familiar unsettling fear of being in a movie where the film has been broken and then spliced together a whole scene later. All of a sudden, sand was churning under my feet as I sprinted across the beach. It was easier for me to run now because all of us co-talkers had a lighter portable radio units but it was not just because the new unit on my back was lighter that I ran so much faster. I no longer had 40 pounds of TBX radio to hide behind and I needed to get cover as fast as I could. Our first waves of alligators had crawled up onto Red Beach just below a sand point. The beach was small, only 200 yards long, but the bluffs made up for it. They looked like they were 10 miles high. You got any hills like that back home, Chief? Smitty yelled. We had taken shelter in a shell crate from the American bombardment. We'd been met with small arms and machine gun fire, but no enemy bombs or shells were falling among us. I peered up toward the bluff where he was pointing with his chin. In time, we'd been together, he'd learned the Navajo way of pointing your lips or your chin rather than your hands. That hill rose up steeper than I would have liked, not really 10 miles, but at least 200 feet. We had to climb it, even though the Japanese were firing down at us from the height. I looked back toward the shore where the tank was being unloaded. As long as we don't have to carry one of those, I think we could do it, I said. 
Then we went running across the beach, dodging back and forth. So we would not be a good target for the small arms, arms fire coming from above. All the way up that cliff, bullets kept spraying the sand in our faces and bouncing off the rocks around us. Somehow, neither of us got hit. But when we got to the top, the fire was so intense that all we could do was dig in along with the rest of the men in our first wave. I got out my radio and began sending. We were going to have to fight for every inch of ground. It was not easy for us to break out from our beachhead. There were over 18,000 Japanese troops in Guam. They mostly been deployed at Tumambe. When the commanders finally realized we weren't going near there, they moved them to head us off and keep us boxed in. We code talkers were kept busy sending message after message from the shore to the command ship. Our headquarters had been set up now on shore and I was told not just to report to the command post, but to set myself up a cot there, housed in the same tent as General Howling Mad Smith. Before long, Admiral Nimitz and his generals were meeting in that tent to discuss battle plans while we Navajo co-talkers waited in the corner right there next to the top brass. I was only in the tent for a little while, but it made me feel extra safe being guarded right along with the general. Eventually, though, I was assigned to a unit moving inland. We began to walk our way into the island. It was a sl slow walk only a few miles at a time, as we took back the coastal towns of Agat, Asan, and Agana, and pushed through the rice paddies to secure the important road junctions. Every town that we took had been destroyed by the enemy as they retreated. It made me feel sad to walk through those broken towns. No living people were to be seen, but there were many bodies of native people who had been slaughtered by the angry Japanese as they pulled back. Finally, on July 25th, there was a lull in the action. Our units were able to regroup. Finally, Smitty said, we can get some rest. I don't think so, I said, hoping I was wrong, but I wasn't. The pause in the fighting did not last. Japanese soldiers had been taught that there were only one thing to do when things were hopeless, when they were surrounded or when their leaders were killed, attack. We Marines always began our battles at dawn. The Japanese though, like monsters, being in our old stories, preferred to strike in the darkness. The night when the first attack came, some of the men in our group were trying to sleep, but I was not. I was just staring out into the darkness, waiting as the slow hours ticked away. 2,100 hours, 2,200 hours. And then just after midnight, it seemed as if the air grew thick and trembled. They are coming, I said, surprised at how calm my voice was. A single scream, so loud and distorted that it didn't seem to come from a human throat toward the night. Shapes began hurling at us out of the darkness and amidst the flashing and crashing of weapons and the smell of gunpowder. We dug in. Many of those attackers were killed by our machine guns, but others fought their way through. At different places in our line, there was hand-to-hand -hand fighting. Each time a wave of attackers was wiped out. Another human wave came screaming in. I cannot recall what I did during those hours of darkness, grandchildren. I am glad that my mind does not allow me to remember. By the time the sun rose the next day, the attack had ended. Our lines had not been broken. 3,500 enemy soldiers had died, including many of their high officers. We had not suffered many casualties, but one of them was John Johnson Housewood, another of our Navajo code talkers. He had been with the 21st Marines, dug in on a small hill just 100 yards past my own foxhole. As he raised his head, a bullet had struck him. He was the third talk, cold talker to die.